Hello. I'm planning a series of uh, videos about trigonometry and its history. Um, like most of my videos, I'm thinking mainly about um, enrichment of the school syllabus, GCSE and A-level in particular. Um, and the history of trigonometry, I think, is absolutely fascinating. So I'm going to be covering um, trigonometry from its very beginnings in ancient Greece through India and up to the modern day. And I'm going to be going all the way from right angle triangles up to, well, I'm going to touch on Fourier transforms because I think one of the things, one of the forms of enrichment that's particularly valuable is um, giving students some hint about where the subject would take them if they took it further. I'm also interested in computation and so I shall be talking about um, how Ptolemy of Alexander, Alexandria, um, calculated his table and also how modern calculators do it, which is quite interesting. Most of that's in the future though, so for today it's right angle triangles. So let me share my screen again. So mathematically speaking, the pre prerequisites for this are very, very limited. A little bit of stuff about triangles and a little bit about circles. Um, it turns out that from very, very, its very beginning, trigonometry was as much, if not more, about circles than it was about triangles. So we shall have quite a lot of stuff about circles as well as triangles. But to start with, I'm going to talk about um, measuring angles, which is quite interesting, actually. So nowadays we mostly use degrees to measure angles, of which there are 180 in a straight angle. And until very recently, we mostly just divided one degree into 60 minutes and one minute into 60 seconds. Um, so uh, those are sometimes called arc minutes and arc seconds to distinguish them from the units of time. So for example, 87 degrees and one eighth of a degree would be 87 degrees, seven minutes and 30 seconds. Um, so this is the Babylonian sexagesimal system in action. So um, how does the sexagesimal system work? Well, when we write seven, seven when we write 87 and an eighth in decimal, we'd write this, which means um, eight lots of 10, seven lots of one, one tenth, two one hundredths, and five one thousandths. So it's just the same as sexagesimal. Um, sexagesimal is base 60. There are 59 digits from one to 59. There isn't a zero, actually. Um, and I've written those in decimal with brackets around them, which is a slightly old thing to do, but there we are. So um, now 87 and an eighth of a degree would be one lot of 60, 27 lots of one, seven lots of a 60th, and 30 lots of um, six, one over 60 squared. Um, so when we say um, 87 degrees, seven minutes and 30 seconds, we're really saying the number of degrees to suit two sexagesimal places. Now, you will read in places that this method of measuring angles goes back to the Babylonians. Uh, well, it doesn't. Uh, this method of, count of measuring things certainly does, and the Babylonians use it for measuring things. Um, their mathematics was quite sophisticated, but it didn't include angle measurements. They, they didn't measure angles, so it certainly doesn't go that far back. It was the Greeks who introduced the base 60 method of measuring um, angles with degrees. Um, they got the sexagesimal system from the Babylonians and they applied it to trigonometry. They actually had three ways of writing numbers. Um, the sexagesimal they only really used in astronomy. And for many years, um, trigonometry was really just a part of astronomy. Anyway, nowadays we mostly use um, degrees and decimals of a degree, which is actually, to be honest, much more sensible. OK, so we're talking about right angle triangles. And we don't get far with talking about right angle triangles without talking about Pythagoras. So a little bit of um, historical context. Pythagoras lived quite a lot, long time before most of the other famous Greek mathematicians you've heard of, like Euclid and Archimedes. So, um, oh, and the people we're going to be talking about in the context of trigonometry were a little bit later. Um, uh, so, um, Pythagoras was already a bit of a mythical figure by the time of Euclid, and, and very little is known about him. Um, it is said that he went to Egypt and learned some mathematics there. Well, he might well have done. Um, it's said even that he went to Babylon, and I suppose that's possible true. Somebody had to bring those sexagesimal digits back. Maybe it was him. Who knows? However, the one thing we know for certain about Pythagoras is that he didn't invent or discover Pythagoras' theorem. And here's how we know that. So this is a Babylonian clay tablet. It's called by the other unromantic name of Plimpton 322 because it was a 322nd item in Mr. Plimpton's collection. It comes from Babylon about 1800 BC, so that's well over a thousand years before Pythagoras. And it's a Babylonian spreadsheet. 
so it's got columns of numbers. In fact, in this column, you can just about see it's a row number. One, two, three, four. You can just about work out. Um, these are sexagesimal numbers. And this, in the header of the spreadsheet, it's got some words which tell you what these numbers are all about. It's been very much studied, this thing. Um, in fact, if you were to rank historical documents in the order of the number of words written about them, divided by the number of words written on them, this one might come top of the list because there aren't many words on it, it's mostly numbers. Um, anyway, it's all about Pythagoras' theorem. These are Pythagorean triples. This is quite a complicated thing, which I'm not going to go into, but these are two of the numbers of a Pythagorean triple. They clearly are Pythagorean triples. And the, and the, um, and the, the header tells you that too. So I'm going to make a separate short video about this thing because it's so interesting and in particular what all this is about. Um, but for now, the important thing is Pythagoras' theorem is a great deal uh, older than Pythagoras, but trigonometry isn't. This is not trigonometry. Okay, so we're talking similar right angle triangles here. So here are some similar right angle triangles. They've all got an angle of 37 degrees in them, um, and they've all got a right angle in them. So the other angle is, yeah, 53 degrees, that's right. The, the other two angles add up to 90, don't they? Um, they're different sizes um, and different orientations. This one, the 37 degrees, is anti-clockwise from the right angle, whereas the others, I think, are all clockwise. Yes, they are, aren't they? That doesn't matter. They still count as similar. Same shape, different size, different orientation, doesn't matter. OK, now let's look at one of those in a bit more detail. So here is a 37 degree right angle triangle. And let's suppose we know one more thing about it, which is that the length of its hypotenuse is one unit. Well, then it really ought to be possible to work out what this is, what this length is. Because now we know the shape and the size of this triangle, we sort of know everything there is to know about it. So we ought to be able to calculate that. The problem is, it's not that easy. Um, it, in fact, it's very difficult to work that out from pencil and paper. Um, we can see some, say some things about it. So it's clearly a function of, of, the, ang of the angle. It gets bigger as the angle gets bigger. Um, and so this function, um, we can give a name. We call it sine of alpha. So most of the functions we meet are called things like f and g. This is quite an important one, so it has a special name, sine of alpha. And we can even draw the graph of it. It's this sort of curvy thing that looks a bit like an upside down parabola, but it, it isn't. I mean, you, in fact, you can see by eye, this is too straight to be a parabola. OK, so that's the angle. That's the, that's the definition of the function sine of alpha. It's the length of that side. Um, now then, if we have another similar right angle triangle. Uh, let's make it a slightly better shape. There we go. Um, well, it's got so it's scaled in some way from this one. So there's some scale factor here, which um, you know, running from quite small to quite big. Um, and the scale factor is, in fact, the length of the hypotenuse, isn't it? Because this is this is one and this is scaled up by the scale factor. So it's the length of the hypotenuse. So if we want to know this side, um, then it must be sine alpha times the scale factor. In other words, the side opposite the angle is um, the length of the hypotenuse times the sine of the angle. Or to put it another way, the sine of the angle is the length of the opposite divided by the length of the hypotenuse. And that's how we mostly think about sine nowadays. So the sine of an angle is the length of the sine opposite divided by the length of the hypotenuse for any right angle triangle. Now, as I said, the problem with this is that um, sine of alpha is not at all easy to work out given, given, um, given alpha. In fact, for most alphas, it's impossible to work out it exactly. Um, uh, for, but you can work it out approximately. So if you want to work it out for to four significant figures, you can do that with a lot of work and a lot more work, get 10 significant figures and so on. Um, so the idea arose that we would, somebody would work out this value for a whole load of angles and write them down in a table so that other people wouldn't have to work them out. And the first person who did that was somebody called Hipparchus in the second century BC. And pretty much th is, that's the way it's been done for 2000 years um, until um, until the computers and calculators arrived. So let's have a look at that. So here we are. This is what a table of signs looks like. In fact, this, um, this comes from my uh, table of math my math mathematical tables from school. Um, so this is a, a table of signs for angles from 0 to 90 to the nearest minute 
um, and it does it to four significant figures. Let's just see how that works. So um, 37 degrees, let's have a look at that. So 37 degrees and no minutes. Um, it says the, the sign of that is 0.6018. Um, if you want 60, 37 degrees and six minutes, it's that much, 6 point, um, 6032. If you wanted 37 degrees and eight minutes, well, it's going to be a little bit more than this, isn't it? Um, you want to go another two minutes on, and two minutes um, gives you these things here called proportional parts, tell you that you need to add five in the last decimal place. So there you are, 0 0.6037 is the sign of 37 degrees and eight minutes. So this is how it's done pretty much since the time of Hipparchus. Hipparchus wouldn't quite recognise these. For one thing, he didn't quite do a sign table. I'll come on to that. And of course, he didn't use these sorts of numerals either. But, you know, he'd have, he'd have recognised the idea. Within half an hour, he'd explained it to him and he'd say, oh, yeah, I see. You're still using my idea, right? Well, that's jolly good. So that's how um, how this was done for getting over 2000 years. Nowadays, of course, you can just punch 37 degrees into a calculator and press the sign button. And there you are. You've got the answer in a, in a flash. Um, but I said, although I said uh, for humans, it's quite hard work to work out um, uh, the sign of an angle to 10 decimal places. It's dead easy for a calculator. Uh, actually, you can put um, degrees, minutes and seconds into the calculator if you choose. But mostly we don't do that now. We just use decimals or degrees. So that's all very well. But what about, as it were, the other way around? Supposing now we know a triangle in the sense that we know the length of the hypotenuse and the side opposite this angle, but we don't know the angle. Well, that's all right, isn't it? Because we know that sine A is opposite over hypotenuse, so it's easy enough to calculate over H and, um, and use the function backwards, as it were. So in mathematical notation, A would then be sine to the minus one of O over H, or it's sometimes called arc sine of O over H. Um, and you can use the same table. So let's move on to this table and suppose the same table. Sorry, Let, let's move into looking for an angle, the angle whose sine is exactly 0 0.6. Well, you can see it's somewhere in here, can't you? It's going to be between there and there. So it's, th it's 36 degrees and some odd. So 36 degrees and 48 minutes is is um, sine of that is 0 0.5990. And this one here says um, sine of 37 degrees and 54 minutes is 0 0.604. Um, and so to get to 0.6 exactly, we need to go four back from that one, if you like. Well, five's good enough. So arc sine of um, 0.6 is 37 degrees and 52 minutes. You can't play quite the same trick on a calculator. You can't use the same button. You have to use a different button. So there's a sine to the minus one button on a calculator, um, as well as the sine button. OK, so I said before, Hipparchus of Nicaea was the first guy to do this. Um, his tables have actually been lost. Um, Ptolemy of Alexandria did it next. He was um, uh, he was uh, lived in Egypt, but he was uh, he was um, he was a Greek. He, he uh, spoke Greek, wrote in Greek, um, and um, his table survived. So we know exactly what he did. But anyway, the broad sweep of this picture is interesting. So um, the next guy who did anything significant is in India, um, and then all these people across the Middle East wrote in Arabic. Um, these are not. These people are not necessarily Arabic, uh, but they wrote in Arabic because Arabic was the language of scholarship across the Middle East and North Africa in the way that Latin was in Europe. And then finally, it got back into mainstream Europe uh, when Richard of Wallingford was the first person to write all this up in Latin, making it accessible across Europe. So it got from Greek to Latin uh, via Sanskrit and Arabic, and it took well over a thousand years to do it. Well, getting on for 1500 years, really, which is remarkable, isn't it? We'll come back to some of these guys later. OK, so um, what can we do with this stuff? Uh, well, the obvious thing we can do is solve a right angle triangle. So what I mean by solving a right angle triangle is finding sort of everything there is to know about a triangle, given, well, given enough information to do that. Um, uh, in, and that can come in various forms. So, for example, the one we've already dealt with, we know an angle, we know the length of the hypotenuse. We can work the side opposite the angle by taking the hypotenuse, multiplying it by sine of alpha. Um, then we can work out this angle by subtracting that one from 90, and then we can use Pythagoras to finish it off. Um, if, if you know the side opposite, well, it's actually quite similar, isn't it? Because now we, we can work out that H is O divided by sine of alpha rather than, rather than multiplying. And then we carry on as before, work that angle out, and then work that one out with Pythagoras. This one's slightly different. If we know um, if we know the side adjacent to the angle that we know, then what are we going to do now? Well, 
uh, we're going to calculate this angle first. That's the easiest way to do it. And now we're back in this situation, essentially, but using this angle instead of this angle. So the hypotenuse then we work out by taking this and dividing by the sine of that. And then we finish it off with Pythagoras' theorem. The other case is where we don't know any angles. So if we know two of the three sides, it doesn't matter which two, because we can easily work out the other one with Pythagoras' theorem. So then we know all three sides. And then we can calculate one angle using the arc sine or inverse sine function. Um, as we've seen, and then um, and then the other one we'll work out as um, well. We can either do ninety minus this one, or we can use arc sine of um, uh, use arc sine the other way around, arc sine of this of this over that. Okay, so we can do everything we need to do um, with just sine, uh, and indeed the first tables were almost uh, sine tables. However, um, it turns out there are um, a whole lot more ratios um, and they've all got names. It's all a bit silly nowadays, actually, to be perfectly honest, but we've got them, so we better look at them. So what we know already is that we've got the name of, we've got sine beta, which is the opposite of a hypotenuse. And, and we can see that sort of rises up from uh, naught up to one. Okay, well, cosine is defined to be adjacent over the hypotenuse, the length adjacent over the length of the hypotenuse. And that's um, that sort of goes the other way around, doesn't it? Because um, it goes from pretty well one down to zero. Um, and then we've got tangent of beta. Um, so if you've not met these before, you won't remember them, but I'll tell you how to remember them in a moment. Um, so this is opposite over adjacent, sort of six altogether, aren't there? Let's push through. press on this thing called cotangent, which is adjacent over opposite. And now it's getting really arcane. There's a secant, which is hypotenuse over adjacent. So that's one over cosine, of course, a relationship there. Um, and um, a cosec is hypotenuse over opposite, which is the uh, is one over sine. Now then, where do all these names come from? To do that, we need this picture. So I put those things up there to remind us that we can refer to them. Um, now, for the ancients, and actually until quite recently, these things were not thought of as ratios. They were thought of as lengths um, relative to a particular circle. So I'm going to take a circle of radius one and we'll work out what all these words mean. Um, so the first one is tangent. So if we think in this triangle, then that over that uh, is the tangent of beta because it's opposite over adjacent. Um, and this is one, so that's tangent bit 10 beta, oh, and it's a tangent, right? It's tangent to the circle, so that's why it's called tangent. Similarly, this one, well, this one over that, and again, we're using this as one, so that over that is hypotenuse over adjacent, um, which is secant. And, and this is not a word we use much in geometry, but this line is a secant, this line segment running from the origin, cutting the circle out to here is called a secant. So this is a tangent because it touches the circle. This is a secant because it cuts the circle. And that's where those words come from. Now then, we need a different triangle now. We need sine. So now we're going to use this as the, uh, as the radius of length one. And now opposite over hypotenuse is the sine of beta. So this is sine. Now, why is it called sine? This is where it gets mysterious. So the guy he named this first was Aryabhata, um, writing in Sanskrit. And um, so this is, we know, that we know this is an arc, don't we? Um, and Aryabhata called it an arc too. Um, Latin, in, in Latin, arc means bow, as in bow and arrow. And, and that's what the Sanskrit word meant too. Um, and we know this as a chord, uh, and that's a string. It's, it's the bow string. So we got a bow and its string, and this is a chord. And that's exactly the same in Sanskrit. So the word that Ari, Aryabhata used for sign meant half a chord in Sanskrit. So remember the next spies who got hold of this spoke Arab spoke and wrote in Arabic. Um, so what they did was take this Sanskrit word that meant half a chord and transcribe it into Arabic, making a new Arabic word that sounded like the Sanskrit for half a chord. Um, and then when it got into Latin, an unfortunate mistake was made because this new Arabic word 
um, sounded like the word for a bay, as in the Bay of Biscay type bay. Um, and so, and the Latin for one of those is sinus. So it got translated into Latin as sinus. <laughs> and then that got uh, anglicized into sign. So it's an anglicized version of a mistranslation into Latin, of a transliteration into Arabic of the Sanskrit word for half a chord. That's why it's called sign. Okay, uh, now what about the others? Okay, so so we've done all the ones without co in their names. Um, and I'm going to turn that one around a bit. So that's still a tangent, and that's still a secret. I do that because now I can put the other ones in. So this angle here is 90 minus beta. It's the complement of beta. That's what the complement of an angle is 90 minus it. So this side here, just looking here, is, is the tangent of beta dashed. It's the tangent of the complementary angle or the cotangent of the original angle. And you can see from this is a beta, so uh, and this is one. So this thing over one is adjacent over opposite as far as beta is concerned. So it's tan beta. It's cotan beta. Sorry. It's adjacent over opposite as far as beta is concerned. So it's cotan of beta. And it's called cotan because the tan of the complement. In the same way, this is the secant of uh, beta dash and the secant of the complement, and so the cosecant of beta. And finally, this is the sine of beta dash, the sine of the complement, and therefore the cosine of beta. As it's um, cosine adjacent of hypotenuse. So as far as this beta is concerned, um, it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's adjacent of hypotenuse. Oops. Right, so, um, there they all are, those six lengths, as the ancients thought of them, not ratios. Uh, it's worth looking at the graphs of all of them. Um, there they all are. So we've already met sine, uh, which go, climbs up from zero to one. Cosine is the complement. So it sort of goes backwards. It goes from nine, it goes the same shape, but running from 90 to north instead of naught to 90. Tangent, well, let's have a look at what tangent looks like. So that's this dark blue one, and that runs from um well zero up to well infinity really so there it is going from zero up to infinity and cotangent being the complementary one goes the other way from zero to infinity that way and similarly uh, let's look at secant so um here's the secant so it starts at one actually doesn't it look it's going from one up to um well infinity again so here's the secant and cosecant is the same but backwards because it's the complementary one now then, um, Hipparchus didn't, I mentioned earlier, didn't quite produce sign tables. Um, what he actually produced was this, a table of this length, which is a chord. It's called, a, and it's called the chord of beta. So it's, if you like, it's a seventh trigonometric ratio. We'll meet a lot more later. Um, and well, it's very closely related to sign. If we draw this line here at right angles to that one, um, so this is half a chord, this is one, this is a right angle, so this half chord thing is the sine of a half beta, because this is divided in two, isn't it? So what's telling you is that the chord of beta is twice the sine of a half beta, or to put it in another way, um, sine of beta is a half of the chord of two beta. So they're very, very closely related. A table of chords and a table of sines are virtually the same thing. But let me draw it another way. So here is the arc and the chord. Now, I mentioned before that um, uh, the, uh, the ancients thought of these things as length. So the chord is definitely the length of this. Um, and the tape, the index to it, as it were, the, the other entry in the table is the, is the arc measured in degrees. Um, so actually, because all these things are lengths, you need a radius uh, involved, don't you, to be able to get convert from degrees to lengths. And, and so the radius, they didn't use one as their radius. Um, which I just did. Ptolemy used 60, Aryabhata used, th used 3,438. <laughs> oh, I've forgotten that. Um, anyway, so the point is that the, these tables were the tables converting degrees of arc into, um, into lengths. And you'll notice there are no triangles involved here. It's only a circle. So the very beginning of trigonometry didn't have any triangles in it. It only had a circle. And an, and a chord. Incidentally, the reason those um, 
the minutes and seconds are called arc minutes and arc seconds is is this again this picture because this arc would was measured in degrees we've got these six lengths and they're, they're all closely related to one another of course because there's really only one thing going on um so we've learned so far about um, again, I've copied all the definitions here. So um, we've learned the relationship of sine and cosine, the co-relations. So there are three of those. So cosine of beta is sine of 90 minus beta. Cosec is sec of 90 minus beta. And cotangent is tan of 90 minus beta. Originally, those, that was the definition of these things. It isn't nowadays. Um, then we got some reciprocals, which we nowadays use for the defini these, definition of these things. Excuse me. So cosec is one of a sine, sec is one of a cos, cot is one of a tan. Just to look at this one, for example, sec is hypotenuse over adjacent, cos is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's that set of relations. But another lot, we sort of have sort of called cancellation. So if you take sine and divide it by cos, you get opposite over hypotenuse divided by adjacent over hypotenuse. Um, and the, the hypotenuse is cancelled, so you get opposite over adjacent, which is tan. So sine over cos is tan. And in a similar way, cos of a sine is cot. Actually, there are four more you can get out of this, and they're all useless, so don't bother them. Finally, um, we can use Pythagoras' theorem. We get a whole, lot more, a whole load more of identities out. So Pythagoras' theorem says adjacent squares plus opposite squared is hypotenuse squared. So if we divide that thing by the square of the hypotenuse, we get this, which turns into sine squared beta plus cos squared beta equals 1. If we divide instead, divide instead by opposite squared, we get this. Uh, which is uh, cot squared plus 1 equals cosec squared. And if we divide by adjacent squared, we get this, which is 1 plus tan squared equals sec squared. So that's, those are all different ways of expressing Pythagoras' theorem with the trigon trigonometric ratios. But actually, all you need is sine, which, which is what we started with, wasn't it? So we can define cos in terms of sine using the complementary thing. We can use tan using sine over cos. We can then define sec as one over cos. Cosec, we can either do one of a sine or um, or sec of um, sec of ninety minus beta, and then cot. We've got three ways of doing it. We can either do cos of a sine or one of a tan, or the tan of a complement. So going back to those people who did all this, so Hipparchus, as I mentioned, was the first person to do it. He used the chord function instead of the sine, um, and his tables have been lost, so we we don't know a lot about them. Uh, uh, there are references to them, but no, no, no copies of them. Um, Ptolemy of Alexander is, you know, getting on for 300 years later. Um, so this is the earliest surviving one. These did, these did survive. They were copied widely at the time and, and they're still around. So we know what, exactly what they looked like. Um, still, it's using the chord, not the sine function. Um, and, um, and he went to great lengths explaining how he would calculated his table. So that's interesting. And we'll go into that in, in a later video. Um, Aravata I've talked about, um, he was the first person to use sine um, as opposed to chord, and also not quite cosine, but one minus cosine, uh, which is a function that has yet another name, versine, and we'll come to that one later. That's quite important, uh, or it used to be anyway. Um, and then this guy was the first one to um, use tangents. Now, tangent has a slightly different history from sine and cos, because all these guys are astronomers, primarily. Um, and sine and cosine were born by were born in astronomy. Tangent, however, uh, was born in um, making sundials, and this was the guy who brought them together. So, uh, sort of trigonometry escaped from the clutches of astronomy around this time. Until then, it had been just thought of as a tool for astronomers. Um, this guy was the first to use the secant and the cosecant. Now, then, uh, one more thing to say, actually. I mentioned, didn't I, that you can't calculate these values exactly. Well, there are one or two you can. Um, so this picture is normally drawn without the circle, but I, I'm going to put the circle in. Um, so if we've got a 45 degree angle in a right angle triangle, then, of course, that angle is 45 degrees as well. This is an isosceles triangle. And so these two sides are equal. Let's call it x. Well, x squared plus x squared is 1 squared. And so that tells you that x is 1 over root 2. And that tells you that uh, sine of 45 degrees is 1 over root 2. It's that over that. Cos of 45 degrees is that over that. That's also 1 over root 2. Um, and tan of 45 degrees is that over that is 1. 
Right. The other one you can do easily is 30 degrees. So here we have a 30 degree triangle. This time we need to do another trick, really. We need to put in this reflection here uh, in the x axis. Um, and then, of course, that angle is also 30. Um, this length is also one. Those angles are 60. And, and this is a half because this is now an equilateral triangle. So that length's a half. And so this, if we call this x, then we have x squared plus a half squared is one squared, which tells us that x is root three over two. And therefore that um, these, so sine of 30 is a half over one. Um, cos of 30 is root three over two over one. And tan of 30 is a half over root three over two, which is one over root three. Um, and of course, you can do, you can also work out the angles for 60 as well now. So there we go. Uh, sine of 60 is root three of its cos of 30. And cos of 60 is sine of 30. Tan of 60 is um, root three. If you like, it's cotan of, of, of 30. Okay, so that's almost it for this video. I will finish with the example, going back to history, the very first trigonometric calculation that I'm aware of. Um, this is um, Aristarchus. So this is almost, uh, he's almost a contemporary, well, he is a contemporary of Euclid, slightly younger, um, and quite a bit before Hipparchus. So he didn't have Hipparchus's table of trig values to work with, but and he was an astronomer, of course. So what he was trying to do, he was a sensible guy. He knew that the planets moved around the sun and the moon moved around the earth and all that sort of stuff. Um, and he decided he wanted to know how much further the sun was than the moon. And he came up with this really clever wheeze that he would look at the moon at the sort of first quarter and judge with the naked eye of course when this line here dividing the light from the dark was exactly straight because he worked out that what that would mean that this angle from him to the moon and onto the sun was a right angle and in that case the ratio he wanted to the distance to the sun over the distance to the moon was what we would now call the sec of 87 degrees and he worked that one value out not to any great accuracy, he got it to be about 19, which it is roughly. Uh, so that was a really clever idea. Trouble is, of course, it's completely wrong because the sun is about 400 times further away than the moon. Um, and um, uh, well, it was hopelessly optimistic to think that he could determine when this um, was a straight line um, accurately enough when the sun's shining as well, by the way. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, so you'd have to you'd have to determine it to within a few minutes, minutes of time, that is. And you really can't do that. The real angle here is more like um, 88 degrees and 50 minutes. So it's much closer to a right angle than this and really impossible to tell. Anyway, there we are. So um, I'm going to move on in my next video. The next one will be a short one about Plimpton 322, that um, Babylonian spreadsheet, because I think that's fascinating. And then on the next the next one, we're back to um, mainstream trigonometry with some stuff about um, getting out, outside the realm of right angle triangles, angles bigger than 90 and so on. Okay, I hope you enjoyed it.